Listen, you're not gonna find anything on me, okay? Trust me. Empty your pockets into the tray, sir, or we'll have to. Your pockets, sir? Lady, the problem isn't in my pants. No! Welcome back to thinking. Sorry. Really, you're gonna yawn in the in the intro, Doc. I am back sorry. To you're interrupting me now. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes, and it's that time of the week where we talk about all things X-Men here on the channel. We're gonna talk about Hellions, which I think is just a fantastic comic book. It's damn near a highest recommendation, almost a five-star comic. Also, we got the finale of Juggernaut. I enjoyed it. It wasn't the best miniseries in the history of the world. Very well illustrated, but we'll we'll get into that as well. Obviously, here with me to talk about that is the X Men historian, the Marvel aficionado. Doc, how you doing? I am very good, man. I am really happy to be here. I completely agree with you about Hellions. It's once again proving why it's the best X book. Shockingly, yes, Mutant Suicide Squad is easily the the best X Men book. It's the only team that feels like they're they're out there, you know, kicking butt and taking names like the X-Men should be. And um, so before we get into all the details of this week in X-Men and talk about these comics, I do want to say, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Give us a thumbs up if you enjoy this. Give us a thumbs down if you don't. Either you want to hear your thoughts about the this week in X-Men. Did you enjoy Hellions? What are your thoughts on Juggernaut? Let us know. Now let's get right into Hellions. I'm going to tell you, Doc, when I read this, this little part right here, I was literally laughing out loud i don't do that a lot with comic books i will chuckle i will grin but i do not <laughs> normally laugh out loud you know in a room while i'm reading a comic book but this part where we have cameron hodge doing the villain monologue yeah and then nanny and wild child who are souped up because they were resurrected from Araco, just going past them and being like we ain't got time to for this we gotta go start destroying stuff i absolutely love it like get back here <laughs> yeah it was you know <clears throat> seeing see and then hodge's reaction to it was was pretty great uh with you know they had the same reaction that most people would have during the villain monologue just nope i ain't got time for this i'm gonna go back and do the thing that i was planning to do in the first place too much talking i agree yeah <clears throat> so it, this is a cool story obviously they need to get a new armor for orphan maker yep so they've got to find nanny's ship so they can rebuild that otherwise he could potentially destroy the entire world now that they've resurrected it so they're on this island cameron hodge and his army of robots who turn out to be our sentient robots have it in their possession they go on there wild child and nanny are gonna go to uh, take everybody out it's a great opener to the story now the big kind of thing that's going on here is it's all about robots and these robots are like i don't know they're evolving like real time as they're interacting with the with the mutants i thought it was really interesting concept i i do too i mean they're obviously relatively smart they um you know i don't know if you would consider them a full-fledged they're obviously not a full-fledged ai at this point but they are functional with some degree of autonomy because Cameron Hodge is infected by the techno organic virus, you know, from the phalanx he has been for decades now. So he's obviously a more advanced kind of mix AI and human throughout this comic. And so he can obviously control the smiley bots. Now the thing is, yeah, there was an interesting evolution of the smileys from the last page on the last issue when they first show up throughout this entire issue they they go from being just basically cannon fodder for hodge and enfor cannon fodder and enforcers to almost being characters themselves which was interesting and uh, you know what it made me actually like connect with with smileys um we'll, which we'll get to that part doc We're, we will get to that part so there is a big reveal Empath is going to sit there. He's going to try and make Cameron Hodge do something he doesn't want to do so he can stop him. Turns out he can't He can't do anything. He gets his like throat slit or whatever, and it turns out he reveals Cameron Hodge is a robot himself. Cameron Hodge does not believe that. He tells the his uh, smiley bots, you know, 
it's time to kill me because you, you can't kill me if I'm not a robot. And they blast him because he absolutely is a robot. <laughs> yeah, you know what? That was kind of great. It was, I mean, it was obviously the leading up to that, but it was still great. Like Cameron Hodge was so absolutely sur- and that was the thing. That's the thing that's always been interesting with Cameron Hodge. He's always so absolutely certain of himself. And but we find out that he's this version, at least, of Cameron Hodge is full robot with, I guess, Cameron Hodge's personality downloaded into it. They didn't even realize it was a robot. Um, yeah. You know, kind of a very more recent Terminator vibe out of it. Definitely the most heroic death Empath has gotten so far. How many times has he died? Is this the second or third time? I think it's I the think third that- time. No, this is this is definitely at least the third time because he yeah, got maybe. killed in the second issue, and then uh, he, he died in uh, coming back from Morocco, and he dies here. Yep. I don't mind seeing that character eat it every time because he's such a jerk off. Yes. But, uh, this was almost a heroic death. I, I enjoyed. It. He he enjoyed seeing Cameron Hodge realize that he was a robot as well. So there's some some interesting stuff going on here. And even John and- Gray Crow was kind of like. Hey, you, you you died okay this time. He's the one that's killed him like twice. <laughs> yep. So Grey Crow and Psylocke, they get word from Krakoa. They're like, the robots are infected with techno organic. They're they're somewhat they're becoming sentient. We have a basically a standing order. You have to destroy them. Yeah. And what's going on, Havoc is talking to the robots and he like connects with them. Yeah, he is. They're like becoming good. And I felt pretty bad for Alec, if I'm being completely honest. Like, like the horror on his face as he realizes, you know, he, he thinks he just saved these guys. And then uh, Psylocke ends up pushing the button and just destroying all of them. Yeah, because you can see the Krakoan language coming out of his mouth. So he immediately knows, you know, the smileys out of the smileys mouth. So Alex immediately knows it's a, you know, Krakoan virus. And then... All of the progress he's made in kind of, I guess, I guess you could say race relations here between AI and mutants is immediately wiped out. <laughs> and, you know, it, it does, you know, but at the same time, it's nice to see somebody in the X office remember this mandate. And I definitely felt bad for, for Havoc. I feel bad for Havoc a lot in Hellions. They're kind of continuously screwing him over, and I think they're going to drive him insane. I think so, too. I think you're probably going to get back to evil Alex, um, which they've done. I'll tell you right now, with everything I'm seeing, I would kind of be rooting for evil Alex. Oh, I I would be, too. He's got some reasons. Oh, yeah, he definitely. I mean, anything that at this point, if Alex goes, quote, unquote, evil, he definitely really earned I pushed it. into it. <laughs> yeah, he definitely earned it, and it's it's definitely well within his right. <laughs> so there's another story arc. Obviously, we we hit on it. We've got Wild Child and Nanny going to take the ship so they can make a new. It's it's the crib so they can make a new, um, you know, armor. containment armor for Orphan Maker. And they wipe everybody out. They, they take this ship with relative ease. But there's a big reveal on the very last page. It's a baby smiley. So the robots that, are born? No. So Well, I don't. That I'm a little confused about. I don't, I don't know. But I guess it's symbolically supposed to be a young and maybe the next step in their evolution where the the smileys were on the cusp of actual evolving into actual AI, whereas this baby may be the first of that breed. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, there's no way Nanny's going to leave a baby behind. Oh, no. And she's taking it under her care. And this isn't just your normal Nanny. This is badass, take no prisoners, can whoop anybody on the face of the planet Nanny. So I think it's a, it was a cool reveal, and I think it's a, a cool evolution in the story. And it makes sense for the characters. Nanny might still look like a friggin' egg, but she, unlike the past, she's no longer a uh, a liability in the field. So I absolutely loved 
this issue of Hellions. It might be the best issue of Hellions so far, and Hellions has been really good. It was damn near perfect. Love the art, love the story. So many cool beats, and it was just completely enjoyable. Now let's get over to the other. Uh, there, I think there was an issue of X Factor this week. I'm not covering that. Uh, the other issue that we are going to cover is uh, Fabio Nicienza and Ron Garney's Juggernaut miniseries. It's obviously over. Fair, fairly rel- straightforward story, but we got to an ending that I wasn't exactly expecting. But essentially, Juggernaut and D Cell are storming the castle. They're going in there. They're going to release all these mutant prisoners. They find out that there are no mutants in there. They got to go through this teleport- teleportation device. Turns out they're outmanned and outgunned. He tries to escape by jumping through essentially a hel- helicarrier, and they have to go back in and they get caught. I generally enjoyed this issue, but it was it was a little surprising. There was a lot of cool twists in it. Yeah, so this one was was unexpected, and he says, "Listen, the girl's a mutant, and she needs to speak, speak to Krakoa. You can't arrest her." He's got a valid point. <laughs> now, this entire time during this miniseries, she has said, I'm not a mutant. I got my powers another way. And we, we finally learned what she really is and why she claims that she isn't a mutant. Because when she discovered her power, she was in the backseat of her parents' car. Her deceleration power has kicked in. She obviously couldn't control it at that time. She was a brand new mutant. And she is essentially the reason that the car crashed. Yep. So if it if she was a mutant and it was her power, then she basically feels like she killed her parents, so she can't accept that. Obviously, and it wasn't her fault. She couldn't have chosen the time for her mutant power to kick in, but that is why she was claiming not to be a mutant. Yeah, I mean, I think she was trying to kind of justify it, at least in her mind, that she kind of got her powers like Matt Murdock as the result of the act, not as the cause. You know, and, and and it's kind of a an interesting commentary. Like, there's a kind of an interesting commentary that you can look at on the way that cause and effect have been weirdly twisted around in a lot of people's minds over the last decade or so, where the effect justifies the cause or excuses the cause. And you've seen a lot of that in the world over the past decade and seeing it out of a what zenial or whatever the hell they're called like zoomer or whatever the hell they're calling this generation's kids in a comic not surprising and it all kind of plays into her not wanting to take responsibility also well, I don't very want to zoomer not take responsibility she doesn't want to deal with the fact that Yes, that's her what I mean. Her being a mutant is why her parents are dead. Yeah, I, and I don't mean that like she had any control over it. But I mean the emotional responsibility, the mental responsibility of accepting that situation. Yeah. Whether whether you had any control over it or not, you still have to accept that responsibility if you want to move past it. Because it well, was as a result of her, whether she had any control or not, she can she can forgive herself. Well, I don't think she's been ready for that, but she no. finally does admit that she's a mutant. Now, we did learn earlier in the story that the you know Charles and the telepath and Krakoa cannot essentially like scan her because of her powers mess with them. She finally goes to a Krakoan gate. Charles meets her. It's confirmed she is a mutant. She's going to Krakoa. She's not going to be able to be a be a like a Twitch streamer anymore. Yeah. But she is going to be uh, on the island paradise to to grow up there. It was it was a it was a good ending for the character. It was interesting where they decided they were going with this. But then Juggernaut's interesting ending might have been even more interesting. We'll talk about that in a second. What did you think about her going to Krakoa? A lot of this miniseries has been about Juggernaut trying to make amends, trying to improve things rather than just destroy things and run things over. Um, And I think he managed to really vastly improve the life of D-Cell. And he accomplished that maybe not in the way he expected. That's, you know, he expected doing it by, you know, doing demolition for damage control. Mm -hmm. That's how he would, you know, improve things. 
Um, but he actually managed to do something that, that really mattered to one person. And, and I think that that's kind of a, it, it was the, the ending at least in that regard that he needed. Now what comes next is a little more interesting for me. So apparently he enjoys what he's done. He wants to make a, a change in the world. And he, he basically he's going to team up with some old school villains and they're going to start doing good. I can understand the, 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 the plastic thing and the rock chick, but Arnim Zola, no. Ar this is, it's another one of those cases of no, like you just, you can't do that. Um, I, I don't mind this idea. I just mind it being Arnim Zola involved. Sorry, you, you can't really come back from, from who he is, um, at least not in any heroic way. I mean, not at this point. <laughs> it's an interesting choice. I imagine it was done for a reason, but it feels like this is not the end of the miniseries. It feels like we're going to get something else in the future. I'm, now, I'm hoping so, because I overall enjoyed this, this miniseries and kind of like the maestro getting a sequel mini series with Warren Pax. I'm really hoping we get a juggernaut, you know, sequel mini, even if it's a sequel mini series, because he, I think this one earned it. Yeah, it was quality stuff. It was good storytelling. It's obviously an evolution of the character. So that'll basically do it for this week in X-Men. Just a, a absolutely terrific issue of Hellions this week, a very good ending to the juggernaut mini series. Hopefully it's going somewhere, it, you know, it, it felt like maybe it would just be self-contained. It wouldn't be important. Obviously, it did connect into Dawn of X, Reign of X. You know, uh, there is a new mutant on Krakoa. She's got decelerating powers, and we'll see what they do with her in the future. Is there anything else you need to say before we wrap up this week in X-Men? It's weird to see. You know what's not surprising is the only guy in that X office, the only two writers in that X office that – have a history of writing superhero books, are writing good superhero books, and everyone else that has tried to be everything other than a superhero writer, they're all their books all suck. Struggling. So, yes. If you if you haven't jumped on Hellions, it's still early in the run. Do it. We're not going to be disappointed. This is easily. It's not even close anymore. X Force is good. I'm enjoying Wolverine, but Hellions is. It's the X Force. It's the X Men book that feels like an X Men book. Yes, even if it seems like them doing you know Mutant Suicide Squad, it is the only X book that actually legitimately feels like an X book. Get on it. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us attract more views for the channel. Subscribe for future commentary, comic book news, and reviews. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications. If you want to talk comics, movies, and much, much more, you can follow me on Twitter at Wes underscore from underscore TC. With that, Salamat Po, and I'm out.